Greetings. Uh, it's another Thursday morning, late morning on the East Coast of the United States here in Atlanta, Georgia. That means uh, we have another informational educational webinar for our colleagues. And today is especially useful for those of us who are interested in international business methods, research methods. Uh, good evening again, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Professor Tamer Chavushkin. Uh, we come to you from Georgia State University Cyber, as we usually do on most Thursdays as part of a consortium, MSI consortium of cyber centers for international business education and research that has been offering these educational webinars on international business pedagogy, uh, teaching, uh, research, and practice since April 2020. I, I should just say a few things about our, our webinar today. Before that, uh, some housekeeping. Uh, we record these webinars, and today's webinar is one hour long, and make them available to you for viewing later and also sharing it with your colleagues uh, and your network. These will be available on our Georgia State University Cyber website, as well as uh, our Cyber's uh, YouTube channel. So please uh, check that out later on, especially if you missed uh, certain points. Also, when you exit uh, the webinar at the end of the hour, you will shortly receive an email with a, with a survey, just with five questions. Please respond to those. Uh, they're important to us, both about today's webinar, as well as your suggestions for future webinars. Well, in addition, uh, everyone except the panelists is muted in the webinar. So you will be using your Q&A uh, button for comments and questions. And we appreciate those uh, as we go during this webinar. And uh, our colleagues today will be using uh, uh, slides and we'll make those available also later on to you uh, in the form of an email message that you will be receiving. All, all of you who have received, who have signed up and registered today. So today's uh, webinar is certainly highly informational, educational. It's about bibliometric research bibliometric uh, research methodology. And we have two uh, very good colleagues uh, uh, joining us today, uh, introducing us to this particular research method. We have with us uh, Professor Saeed Sami. Uh, good morning, Saeed. I know you are in Oklahoma, so it's a morning time for you. Yes. Uh, Saeed, of course, is a senior professor at the University of uh, Tulsa. Uh, teaching international uh, business and, and international marketing. Uh, he's uh, well known, requires very little introduction. Uh, he is a well known scholar, having contributed to the IB discipline over the years. Uh, certainly uh, a phenomenal uh, uh, mentor, also uh, to many uh, young colleagues in the discipline. Uh, and also he's been recognized by several associations, including the Academy of International Business as a fellow. So Said is an AIB fellow, which means that he is one of the senior intellectual uh, characters, intellectual leaders of our community. Uh, Said, I know you've also been recognized as a fellow, distinguished fellow of the Academy of Marketing and Science. So I'll keep it uh, right there in the interest of time. Uh, welcome again. And we welcome Brian Chabowski, Professor Brian Chabowski, also from the University of Tulsa. But Brian, uh, today you are joining us from Vasa, Finland, where you've been serving as a Fulbright scholar. Uh, yes. And, uh, and you're, you're, you told me earlier that you are just about to complete your stay there and it's been an enjoyable and rewarding experience for you. Uh, we're yeah. glad to hear that. Of course, Brian is well published as well, uh, especially with bibliometric research. Uh, he has several uh, illustrations, applications of this research in the literature. Uh, Brian has also many uh, 
accolades, teaching awards, and, and awards from the American Marketing Association, in particular, Journal of International Marketing, uh, for the most significant contribution to advancing international marketing practice. Brian, uh, of course, you received your PhD uh, from Michigan State University and your MBA from Indiana University. And I'll just keep it there because the topic today is something I've been looking forward to. And I have uh, my questions, you know, what is, I think you'll get us started, Saeed and Brian, uh, telling us what is bibliometric research method you know, how is it different than literature reviews, meta-analysis, which we covered in earlier uh, webinars, uh, and, and where do you use it, and how do you use it, and what are the advantages and, and trade-offs with the other research methods? So welcome again, and let's get started. Thank you very much, Tabar. I'm going to start off, uh, uh, and then uh, we both actually will jointly uh, come in and go out depending on the topic under uh, on the discussion. Um, first, uh, again, thank you very much for that uh, very nice introduction and for the opportunity to share this idea of bibliometrics uh, uh, with everyone. I should also add, and I know Brian will add uh, uh, anything I leave out uh, and complete the, the, the coverage, uh, that, that we are really focused today on a very specific type of bibliometrics that, uh, that's co-citation and, uh, and, and we'll limit our discussion uh, and focus our discussion on that, on that topic. Um, so I think for the sake of uh, sort of just uh, follow through, let me share the slides uh, uh, right now, and then uh, you probably see less of us and more of the slide, but uh, let me just get started with that. So um, to, I, I think that the question that uh, Tamer raises uh, is, a, is, is a valid one. Um, and, and I think it's a, it's a good starting point, an excellent starting point. This is roughly the, uh, the outline that we will follow. Uh, we'll spend a good bit of time talking about that actually first question that uh, Tamer uh, brought up. And I think that's, uh, that, that's where we will uh, be, be the starting point for, uh, for us. Now, you know, what's the distinction between literature reviews and, and other uh, forms of uh, you know, coverage, meta-analyses and bibliometrics that we're gonna talk about today? The, uh, Literature reviews um, are familiar to everyone. This is what we do to, in any research and periodically we actually do an in-depth systematic literature review and uh, examine a, a researcher defined body of knowledge. This could be by the decade, it could be by a construct, it could be by a particular topic. Uh, in, in ID, for example, it could be the liability of foreignness. We'll search for all the articles we can find uh, for a particular decade or a particular period of time uh, on that topic or any other topic and, and examine it thoroughly and examine every research in terms of what the, what the findings were and uh, what the models look like or what the theories were and really develop an in-depth understanding of each, each research. Meta-analyses, another form of basically summarizing the literature is uh, more interested in uh, looking at the results of the, uh, of the data and, and, and the conclusions that arrive from the statistical analyses. Uh, in every body of literature, there are um, conflicting interests and conflicting uh, uh, findings. Uh, there could be complementary uh, constructs introduced in midstream in, in a literature. And meta-analysis tries to summarize those relationships uh, and, and, and report uh, a, a sort of uh, holistic uh, outcome of do we in some know that there is a literature reports a, a, a relationship between two separate constructs or uh, maybe the literature as a whole um, does not support that, uh, uh, even though some bodies or some particle, uh, articles might, uh, uh, might support it. 
and, and, and it's very really useful in summarizing uh, the statistical findings of literature. And of course, uh, as we know, you can actually develop a model in the meta-analyses and, uh, and test that model with hypotheses and make it a full-fledged article. And again, that's a very useful way of, uh, and a different uh, viewing lens to the literature. Bibliometrics is, uh, is a little different uh, from that. And so um, they, they, whereas systematic literature reviews, the SLRs as I call them here, are micro in nature. Uh, the, the, the big picture is what we are interested in and that's the macro uh, as I call it. Uh, we look at the body of knowledge uh, from, uh, from a holistic point of view. Uh, one way to depict this is to uh, consider that if you look at the forest, um, or rather look at and examine each tree, uh, and of course, again, this is where the researcher picks a section of the forest and examines it for you know, the characteristics of each tree. That would be more like an SLR. In the, micro, in the macro sense, uh, the researcher is interested in, in the forest first, look, takes a look at the forest, and then based on some criteria, and in our case, this would be the most influential research, picks those important trees that are parent trees and examine it in, in detail. So we start from top bottom, if you may, rather than bottom up uh, analysis. So it's a very different, uh, different look. I should add that this is, uh, these are complementary. Uh, they are not, uh, they're not replacing uh, literature reviews or meta-analyses. This is just another way of looking at the literature, uh, but the advantage that it offers as we'll see and uh, through our examples is that we can actually uh, develop uh, uh, conceptual frameworks based on this and advanced theory in the field as well. Um, we, we examine the literature from a uh, sort of looking at the holistic uh, view or, or the forest, if you may, uh, to uncover the underlying intellectual structure and, and you know, what are the uh, specific knowledge bases on which the field is based. This is not readily apparent in other forms of literature reviews. As I, as I mentioned, you want to make sure that they're not to understand that this is not a replacement. We don't replace uh, the, uh, the, the basic literature reviews and basic um, uh, meta-analyses. This just is a different way of examining the literature that has the advantage of uh, more objectively developing uh, a, a conceptual framework to advance, advance the field. So what's the rationale? Uh, for this? Um, well, the rationale is actually quite similar to what we normally do with uh, in any research. Um, international business, uh, the case in point here, or any other field, uh, periodically the topics, uh, various topics need to be examined and assessed in terms of understanding where we are and, and, and how the literature is formed or the body of uh, work has, uh, has been formed. Uh, the, uh, the, the fundamental axiom for developing an understanding is, uh, you know, what are the influential research in this field? What are the areas uh, that really influences the field? Again, this is, this is having looked at the forest, identifying the trees that are highly influential in making the forest what it is, as opposed to looking at each tree in the forest, which is, as I mentioned, the characteristic of a systematic literature review. Again, this uh, knowledge, understanding what are the most influential uh, aspects of the literature, in turn allows us to do a much more thorough job in developing insights that are not uh, that are not readily uh, readily apparent. What are some of the questions that we answer in? If, if, if I can insert a question here. Sure. Uh, and, and it's about, you know, how large should the forest be? 
Uh, and I, I, I know bibliometric research does uh, allow us to deal with very, very large literature bases, right? We're talking about thousands. As opposed to, let's say, meta-analysis, which uses correlation coefficients as the basis for its uh, inquiry, mm -hmm. uh, can be done with you know, something much more reasonable, 70, 80. Once you have a literature base, a stream of literature that has, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100, you can do, you can do that. So in a sense, uh, is it correct to say bibliometric analysis research method allows us to deal with really large, really, really large sets of uh, literature? And Absolutely. Sort of I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I think you're right on the money. You're right on target. Um, the, as we will note in, in a bit, uh, bibliometrics allows uh, analysis of large amounts of data, uh, in other words, large numbers of articles. Um, what the size should be is really dependent on the, how you define the field that you want to investigate. The researcher defines that field. Now, if the field happens to be relatively new, um, it may not lend itself to uh, bibliometrics. It all depends on how many uh, pieces of uh, uh, research have been made available and that are accessible. And, and if that is very small, then it may not really have good uh, analytical results. And uh, I think you will remark on some of the examples we have used and maybe that will shed further light on that. But, but you're absolutely correct that uh, it, you know, it, it, it has that capacity to deal with the large amounts of uh, large amounts of data. They have the advantage of not having to rely on just the empirical research, right? Because with meta-analysis, you need that R, which means there is some empirical data analysis behind each of the studies that you included in the meta-analysis, whereas here, I don't think you have to have necessarily just empirical uh, literature. Yes, that, that is correct. I think once, uh, once we define the law knowledge nodes, then we will get into individual findings that sets the tone of what that knowledge node represents or the members of a knowledge node represent. It may be, uh, typically it's in groups of two or three, uh, but then those define the area rather than the statistical uh, parameters that uh, defines uh, meta-analysis, or works in meta-analysis. But, but again, that, that, is, that is one of the advantages of bibliometrics. And so, uh, you know, we basically ask these four questions, what's the nature of the focal literature's knowledge structure, what are the research areas uh, uh, that uh, serve as the intellectual foundation of the literature that we have picked? And what are the focal influential research areas? Uh, in the, how do they relate to each other? And then the, what, what is the future research areas, uh, potential future research areas, which is really the outcome of uh, the co-citations uh, analysis that, uh, that, that you're proposing uh, here here today. So as was just mentioned by, by Tamer, uh, bibliometrics has, it has the advantage of being very objective uh, in examining the literature and mapping that literature. And this is a characteristic unique to bibliometrics, which is uh, less likely in other types of uh, reviews. Um, we we uh, have seen increasing um, interest in this area. Uh, I should say that to my reading, this has been uh, slow in terms of growth within business uh, as compared to other disciplines, uh, but uh, it has picked uh, momentum. And of course, nowadays in the last 20 years or so, uh, we see more and more uh, bibliometric research of, of different variety. Uh, they're not all co-citations. Some are, some are not. Uh, we see more and more of those represented. And, and some of the citations we have here that uh, we'll share with you are examples of uh, some of the past research. What are the basic uh, uh, sort of characteristics that makes this uh, unique, makes this method unique? Well, it's, 
it's it la it has I say absence of bias uh, it, it, because it's automated and data driven and the data being the articles that we extract we say that it's an absence of bias uh, because we once you have certain definitions then everything else is uh, sort of data driven rather than uh, subjective uh, and based on the uh, researchers. Uh, uh, decisions. Um, it, it is inclusive, as again, as uh, Thomas so correctly pointed out, that the database and certainly the one that uh, um, is most commonly used, uh, which is the Web of Science, it has about 12,000 journals uh, embedded in it, uh, including the database. Of course, this is across all disciplines, not just business or international business. So it's a fairly rich database. And uh, again, the ability of the procedure to handle large amounts of data. So the, the researcher um, has uh, the access to uh, large quantities of data and because it's machine driven, uh, then it can, uh, it, it, it can manage to, to, to analyze the data. Just think of it as having a sample that's very large versus a sample that's very small in an ordinary research piece. Uh, and, and again, the, the, the size of that is, the, is, is where uh, the topic comes in. You know, newer topics tend to be much smaller. Older topics tend to have big, more popular topics tend to have even more articles. So uh, a number of parameters beyond researcher controls, uh, be, beyond researcher control uh, defines that, uh, that size and so on. So there are a lot of advantages that we see in bibliometrics that are not present in other forms of literature review. What is the backdrop to bibliometrics? Uh, again, as an information piece, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a topic that's been discussed uh, for, uh, for a long time. Uh, and, and, and these are the three key resources uh, based on which uh, we drive our work, but in particular, uh, the oldest one by Thomas Kuhn, uh, 1962, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, is uh, the sort of the, the, the parent and the guideline for this. Uh, interestingly, um, you know, we are here in a social science in, in the business discipline, international business in particular in this uh, webinar. Um, and, and Kuhn was a theoretical physicist that uh, uh, sort of uh, got involved in this uh, by his own account in uh, at Harvard University uh, as a part of the societies of Harvard fellows and uh, and and of course pursued that and his interest was the history of science and so that's how he got into this and of course developed his thoughts uh, and, and and offered it and, and I think this this is what uh, the citation and, and co-citation is largely attributed to him uh, as, a, as a sort of a backdrop to, to bibliometrics. And of course, likewise, the others built on that. And, 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 and of course, this is an established uh, established area. So what's the starting point? Uh, if I can, uh, if I can uh, pause again, uh, both uh, Saeed and Brian. Uh, our good colleague, Nicole Coviello, asked a couple of good questions. Uh, I think these are very relevant. One uh, is this differentiating between, let's say, the most influential past versus old research. I mean, does co-citation analysis allow us to give, let's say, uh, greater emphasis, accentuate certain pieces more than others? And then she also asked a related question, how does co-citation analysis handle uh, those, uh, the citations that are well embedded in an argument versus that are those that are shallow and uh, they're there, but they are not significant. So, you know, how do we sort out the most prominent, the most useful pieces? I guess that's part of the reason why we're doing the call citation analysis, right? Yes. I mean, that's... And, and, and citations themselves may be a differentiating factor there, but uh, can you distinguish between the two types of citations uh, she's asking? Well, I think um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to start off and let Brian pick up where I, uh, where I leave off. And uh, we, 
one of the first things that we'll do, as again, we'll see in the method, and I think Brian is gonna pick up on this, is that once we download the database, that is the literature as we define it, as the researcher defines it, then the next task is to uh, look at the uh, references they have used in, in each of these pieces. So we have, if we have 200 uh, articles drawn from it, from the database, and let's say that's, that's our entire uh, uh, literature per definition, then each of them have, let's say 10, uh, 10 citations, you know, 10 references. So that's 2000 right there. And we will look at that and see the frequency of appearance of each of these throughout the literature. And the literature is 200 articles. And uh, we look at the leading ones and those are believed to be the most influential in forming the body of thought in the literature. Uh, because the logic goes that if they were not um, influential, I mean, if they were not important, people wouldn't be referencing them time and again. Um, the, the question of whether there are gems that are rarely referenced frequently comes up. And of course that's a possibility, but you know, it's sort of um, contradictory to think of a piece as a gem that's rarely cited. Uh, at some point over time, and we're talking about long periods of time, uh, somebody will notice that and will begin uh, to reference it, and then it will snowball into potentially a highly cited uh, piece as well. Uh, Brian, would you like to uh, add to this or? Yeah, I mean, I think you pretty much uh, summarized that it. it's based on the, <clears throat> excuse me, the logic that a citation is indicative of, of influence. Um, and it doesn't really make a distinction between shallow and, and deep uh, for um, the, the reason uh, that a citation is a citation regardless. Um, and quite honestly, um, you could say that uh, the, the distinction between what is shallow and what is not um, is uh, uh, a, a judgment call. Uh, to a certain degree, when you look at the the massive amount of data that we're we're dealing with, and so it's really uh, not our job um, as as researchers to to make that distinction. All we're doing is is reporting and working with and and um, extrapolating uh, on the data uh, based on what we have, based on our findings, uh, which is uh, really um all we can do i suppose you can uh, always do upfront maybe a pre-screening uh and sorting out perhaps some papers and maybe even some journals that you don't want to consider in your analysis that's possible well well the the problem with that though is um you're not being potentially inclusive enough and then you run across the issue with reviewers of um uh, uh, why aren't you being inclusive enough? Or why did you not include this journal or this journal or, or what have you? One thing that we do do um, typically is we screen out method papers um, because this is typically a theory-based exercise. And this is nothing against uh, people who are into methods and anything like that. Um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, like um, articles that, uh, deal with uh, structural equation modeling, um, basic fundamentals or non-response bias like Overton or Armstrong and Overton and, and uh, articles like that. We screen those out uh, because they, they really have nothing to do with the theory that we're, that we're focusing on. So we, we do that um, as, as sort of a, to, to address that, that question that Nicole had to a certain degree. So I guess, uh, you know, again, going back to Nicole's other question, you know, let's say that uh, something that's just been published doesn't have very many citations yet, but it's highly influential. So we kind of uh, have a bias, right, against something that is relatively new and hasn't yet 
received attracted so many citations? And again, that's I think an excellent question and and, uh, and 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 a good point. This really reflects back on on uh, an earlier comment that I made in that you know we need um, this type of research, really all kinds of reviews, but this kind of research on an ongoing basis. So it's not a one-time deal. And the, the reality is that science and fields of uh, endeavor, uh, they evolve, they change over time. And good research is, re is continually being, uh, being, being introduced. So it's, it, it's correct. And in fact, it, the, the, the method may be somewhat biased towards newer, um, newer but you know, very influ potentially influential um, pieces because they haven't had enough time uh, to be referenced as frequently as some of the others. So that's actually a very good point. However, thinking of this in reverse is that something that's new uh, by definition couldn't have influenced what's out there, but it will influence what is going to be out there. So that sort of ongoing uh, process of development continues to take place and that gives really more um, justification for uh, doing this kind of research on an ongoing basis, doing bibliometrics and literature reviews and meta-analyses um, you know, going, uh, going forward. So it's not a one-time deal, but that's an ex excellent question. And you know, I, I think you know, it's I, true. I think it, this goes back to what you said at the very outset, you know, these should be thought of as complementary. Exactly. Rather than competing techniques because what one does not accommodate, the other can. Exactly. And I think this is really, I mean, in, in a way, if you, you know, if you consider a particular piece or maybe a handful of articles that are recent, uh, that you expect them to be highly influential, um, this is where literature reviews uh, can actually incorporate you know, what they have done in a, in a, in a, in a holistic, you know, looking at those and reporting on them. Uh, but the bibliometrics clearly was not gonna pick up on that until somewhat later when it has been, they have been referenced uh, by a large number of articles. Um, and, and I should also add, and I think this is sort of an intuitive outcome that um, you know, obviously the rate of citation uh, uh, has to do with how popular a particular topic is and how many people are engaged in researching it. So the numbers can vary quite considerably. You know, clearly the narrower the field, the fewer researchers or the lesser interest. And, and uh, we know international marketing is much smaller than international business. Um, so you're not going to get the same number of citations for any piece uh, in, in a narrower field like uh, it's sort of a functional area of international marketing versus international business. Um, Thank you. I think in the interest of time, we can move on to the... Actually, I wanted to touch base on this really quickly uh, that uh, Saeed didn't uh, uh, cover is the logic on this is back to Kuhn. Um, yes, there is the historical bias of bibliometrics, but it's based on the logic that uh, past and present research leads to future research. Um, and, and yes, we can't anticipate all possible future directions. I mean, only uh, um, not even geniuses can predict all possible um, directions of, of future research, but uh, what this gives us is opportunities to identify potentialities. And what you'll see later in what we're, what we're going to be describing um, is there are other um, ways to facilitate and understand uh, what other types of new directions can, can become um, that aren't necessarily just based on traditional co-citation analysis, what we're talking about right now. Okay. So. Uh, you know, yeah, very quickly, the time frame is probably, in my mindset, a little less important uh, than, uh, than, than it appears to be. Uh, and the reason for that is that once we look, once, once we zero in on a particular time frame, that's just the published works in that period. But the articles that we extract could have and have referenced uh, anything that is relevant 
uh, in that field. So, you know, we don't truncate uh, the citations by date, rather we decide on what is the relevant period or reasonable and justifiable uh, period of time to examine. Um, you know, we have in the past pretty much been holistic, you know, when, when possible and covered uh, the entire uh, field as, uh, as, as it has evolved. But you could rationalize it in terms of a narrower field. I would say that in addition to time frame, the journals uh, is really the only other, these two are the major uh, controls that, uh, that we have over, uh, uh, over this technique. The time frame and what journals we cite, as uh, Brian pointed out, that uh, you know, unless you know, we need to be inclusive. Otherwise, we can be criticized for uh, systematically having left out an important outlet for uh, for publications. But uh, if if one is reasonable, I think we can uh, we can capture both and and would have good responses uh, to that. The two key databases, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Web of Science is the one that we rely on uh, most often. Uh, we have also used Scopus. Uh, we have found, uh, again, that, that Web of Science tends to be um, less error prone and, uh, and, and, and consistent and uh, has been very, very helpful. And of course, it, uh, as Tamer mentioned a bit earlier, large amounts of data uh, and journals are, are available. Um, and that includes conference proceedings, 160,000 of them. Again, this is across all disciplines. Um, and uh, specific journals uh, basically is, uh, is uh, you're looking at uh, defining the field uh, as reasonably as possible by picking all the journals. I know when we study marketing, uh, international marketing, we actually look at all marketing outlets available on Web of Science. Um, but uh, we can be more narrow if we can be justified. The question is, in our minds, is what is the reason? What's the theoretical or uh, uh, rationale that is justifiable um, to limit the number of journals that, that we cover? But we tried, on average, to be uh, as complete as possible with that. And of course, the follow-up here is uh, developing a set of terms that uh, that we uh, we search the literature for. Um, you know, our, our starting point is always uh, looking at a representative number of uh, articles in the in the discipline, and uh, coming up with some of the terms that are commonly used with that. And it sort of allowed that to snowball uh, to a large set of uh, words representing the field. And then we continue to uh, develop these uh, so that we cover every potential uh, term that we need to use to extract the articles from the, uh, uh, from the web of science. So with that, and in the interest of time, I know Brian has quite a bit of material to cover. So I'm going to stop here and, and have Brian uh, pick up and uh, continue this discussion. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. This is pretty much where we left off. Uh, so moving right along, in terms of the process, um, we take the references from uh, our search, from all of the, the published works, uh, and this is going to end up being the database that we're going to be using <clears throat> for, our, for our project, for whatever it is, whether it's focusing on uh, global branding or country of origin or, or what have you. And uh, kind of like what we were talking about before with, with Tamir, is we're removing the references that uh, don't really have anything to do uh, with with research uh, per se, so editorials, book reviews, biographical items, um, and and also the the method pieces and and what have you. Uh, then we develop a spreadsheet with with all of the cited works, um, and then after that we determine uh, what the most influential or which the most influential. Uh, publications are in the research area. Now, if we split 
our data across different time periods, then we have uh, different most influential lists for each of the time periods. Um, and typically we, we go with about um, 25 to 30 publications. Um, and this is for reasons of, of fit um, of, of, the, of the model. And we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, in terms of the method that we use, I mean, there are a lot of different methods that can be used and that have been used in the literature for uh, co-citation analysis or bibliometrics in general. Uh, you have factor analysis and cluster analysis and uh, something that uh, has gained a lot of popularity recently is visualization of similarities. But we're, we're sticking with the, the, the classical approach of multidimensional scaling. And the reason why we're doing that is because it, it provides us a, a, a good representation of, of the literature, uh, but at the same time, it, it allows interpretability. And, and at the same time, it, it allows for uh, uh, a, a better understanding and uh, a, a way to develop those future research uh, ideas and, and directions, uh, at least in the way we, we apply uh, our, our technique. Uh, we have those, those articles uh, with, we identify those with the, the co-citations um, among those most influential publications. We develop the co-citation matrix um, and uh, the data is going to be in binary form, um, but uh, th this is pretty much the process that we, that we go through. And the binary data indicates that uh, there's a co-citation uh, when, or when a co-citation is present, um, we have a, a one and a zero is when uh, there is not a co-citation. There are also different tools that you can use um, SAS data, et cetera, we use SPSS um, as the, the, the tool of choice. Uh, and then in terms of generating the, the actual uh, matrix that we use as, as input for our um, MDS, MDS uh, results, we use the OCHE uh, correlations. And this is to normalize the data because we have um, the binary data that I, I mentioned before. And uh, the, also because we have highly skewed data typically um, that's, that's well known in, in bibliometric circles. So this is following standard, standard bibliometric procedure uh, that we've pulled from the, the, the bibliometric literature. Um, and then we look at the proximity matrix uh, in MDS as well. So this is going to be based on uh, how, how close our, our different publications are in the, in the data. And in terms of fit, I talked about that before, the stress value um, is we have a, a few different categories in terms of how well the, the model fits with the, with the data. And generally, we're looking for a good fit or better. So a stress value of 0.10, or, or lower is typically good. Every once in a while, we might have a, a stress value of 0.11 or 0.12, uh, which, isn't, which isn't bad. Um, <clears throat> it's a, excuse me, a strongly fair fit. But um, typically we're looking for something below, below that for a good fit that tells us that our, our model is, is, is sufficient. Uh, and we use to, to create our, our research groups and cliques and chains. Uh, we use a standardized uh, Euclidean distance, which is the shortest distance between two points um, of 0.25 or 0.30. Usually we use 0.25 um, and uh, uh, a clique is of course, uh, groups with three or more publications and chains are a combination of of, of groups as you'll uh, see in our, our results here. So uh, well, before, this is- um, If you excuse yeah. me, uh, just to add something about that, that slide and link it back to what you had said earlier. Uh, one of the reasons for limiting the number of publications in a particular configuration or map 
is uh, is that the, the the more publications that are included, the less likely that you have a good fit. So it's really a statistical decision to limit the number of publications that are included. And uh, generally, it does not exceed 30, as Brian has pointed out. I just wanted to make that uh, connection between fit and the number of publications that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that, Saeed. Yeah, OK. So uh, next up, uh, we have uh, these are our uh, results from uh, our our work on global on global branding, and you'll notice here we're not going to go into a lot of detail here, but you'll notice here on the left we have the uh, most influential publications, and down here uh, we have the the research groups, and the research groups. You might be wondering how we come to uh, name these specific research groups, and generally. Uh, that's done by um, examining the nature of the uh, articles or the publications themselves that are in the research groups, as well as looking at the uh, important citing articles uh, that are in the database and trying to get a sense for uh, what the major themes are and trying to distill that into uh, something that uh, is, is succinct uh, that uh, uh, gives a, a good impression or a good idea of what that research group should should be. So you'll notice we have. Um, so that's the judgmental part of the analysis, then, Brian. Right? Yes, yes, Tamir, it is. But we we try to we try to filter out as much um, researcher bias as possible, mm -hmm. um, because uh, typically there's there's going to be patterns in in the the themes uh, that we identify in in those sets of of articles so um there's there is judgment uh but um it's it's based on the quantity of 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 information or uh themes that are presented pretty much okay. yep yeah. okay so uh like you'll notice here we have three isolated groups here. Uh, and then we have what we're calling a one research chain here uh, that focuses on uh, brand origin issues, as you can see, group two, group three, and group four. And we have a research clique here, which has, of course, those three um, um, research publications. And then another uh, research chain here, seven, eight, and nine, which deals with uh, general branding issues, as you can see uh, here. So, and then after we analyze the, this is one way to, to develop results or to develop future research directions. After we analyze the, the results that we had in the previous slide, and, and we look at some of the, the more, more recent publications and more recent influential publications, we, we can sometimes develop, if we have enough variance in the, in the results, we can develop a, a framework for future research consideration. And so that's what we did with this, with this uh, paper, is we were able to, based on the the articles and, and books, the publications that appeared in the intellectual structure for the global branding literature, uh, we were able to develop pretty much this. Uh, it's not an easy task. It, it requires uh, quite a lot of, of, of hammering and nailing and, and things like that. So um, in these projects, Saeed and I typically go back and forth uh, when we work on them together. So. Um, it, it, it takes some time to, to get something that makes sense uh, based, on, based on what we have in, in the results, because you'll see, or you remember that the results don't really have direction, right? Except for, except for the axes, right? There isn't really any directionality. Whereas in a model like this, we have uh, say um, a, 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 an antecedent uh, sort of section, a mediating section, and 
a consequence section. So we have sort of directionality here. So we're, we're introducing something, a model that, that makes sense for, for theory. Uh, but again, that, that, that takes some time to, to develop that, that sort of, of connection. Uh, and these would be the most influential uh, publications for a follow-up study that we did on the global branding literature. Um, focusing on uh, works from 2012 to 2017. And you'll notice we have quite a few of the same uh, research topics and, and uh, influential publications. There were a few, excuse me, changes um, here and there, but uh, again, it's based on those, those most cited um, those most cited works that were that we were talking about earlier. Ryan, uh, to get to this list of twenty-seven, obviously you look at the call citations, but uh, um, how can you insert some judgmental uh, factor there? I mean, do you also do that, uh, or do you just go with the, with the numbers? Well, this is, this is based just on the citations, okay? And then what, what we do is we, we take the, the citation data and we develop the, the co-citation matrix or the, the, the OCHA um, coefficient matrix. And we typically don't really do the interpretation until we, the, the true real uh, interpretation until we get the intellectual structure. I mean, we can get some, some understanding of what's going on by looking at this list, uh, but, but the real benefit of, of, of how we apply bibliometrics and also other ways of, of applying bibliometrics is, is looking at a field as a network. And that's, that's a, a two-dimensional sort of approach. And looking at this as a list is a one-dimensional approach. So it really doesn't give us as much insight by looking at the themes on a, or in a list as it does on a map, like I showed before, uh, to show the interrelationships. And uh, we have, to be honest, we, we have no idea uh, which ones are grouped together, which ones are not. Uh, right now by looking at this list. Uh, we can guess potentially, uh, but, but we don't know. So that's what we need the map for. Right, thank you. So, so just to add to what was just said by Brian, uh, this, this is the basis for developing. These are the, in, in, the, in the case of this table, these are the most cited uh, publications for that period in global branding then we have to examine uh, the literature for, you know, which pieces have co-cited these. And that's how the, the, the conceptual framework emerges. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, and then another way to look at this is to, um, for the same period, uh, to look at the, um, publications or the, the outlets, excuse me, in terms of what or where these, these articles or these publications have been found. And of course, Journal of Marketing and Journal of International Marketing um, have uh, uh, reached the top of the list, of course. And then this is the, the other um, um, aspect of of this, where we're looking at the most influential global branding publications as well. Um, and this is just is the other list that I was talking about before uh, related to uh, related to the same sort of issue of providing a basis for for developing a uh, uh, or an MDS map. And this is the, the knowledge structure for that second period, the 2012 to 2017 uh, period uh, that, we, that we analyzed. And you'll notice we have a very large, what we're calling chain here, uh, and three isolated uh, research groups as well. And 
the the research chain here is dealing a lot with local and global topics, as you can see, and on a variety of, of issues, uh, whether it's uh, consumer attitudes or positioning competition uh, or what have you. There's just a lot of it um, in here. And we have one, two, three uh, cliques as a part of that. So what we are observing here is that the literature in global branding has not converged uh, from what we saw in the earlier map, which was more scattered throughout the uh, configuration. And here we see that the, a lot of the pieces have sort of converged and we can see that the field is being more mature uh, is the way I would interpret that. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, and then since we have two periods here, uh, now we have that initial period from the, the Jibs article that we had, and then we have this follow-up examination. We're able to look at the field longitudinally. Uh, so you'll notice that we have a link of three, uh, three research groups on the left and four research groups on the, on the right, the bolded uh research groups are the ones that are cliques now the the way that we connect these or the reason for each arrow or how each arrow comes to be is if we have the same uh research publication uh appearing in a a group a research group in both the earlier as well as the later um period so, for instance, if a research uh, or if a publication appears in the first period um, in, a, in a research group, but does not appear in the second period in a research group, then there is no longitudinal development. Um, there, it has to appear in a research group in both periods to, to indicate that, that longitudinal development. And this provides us some more information, uh, potentially in terms of developing a framework or developing future research opportunities as well. So, and another kind of uh, like what I was talking about a little bit earlier as well is that gets to, I think it was Nicole's question to a little bit uh, in terms of the old versus new publications, uh, we look at also the most recently uh, published uh, influential articles in a field too. And we look at it a little bit differently where we don't look at the total publications, we look at the citations per year uh, of uh, the, the most recent period or, or over a certain uh, recent period. And since this period was over the 2012 to 2017 period, we, we looked at that. And so we have a list of about 14 um, uh, articles here, which is, is suitable for, for the analysis. And what we do is uh, we, we look at the, the themes here, and this gives us more information uh, in addition to the intellectual structure that, that we already saw and the longitudinal uh, development that we already saw to, to give us more um, information to better understand potentially where the where the 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 field is going, so we can propose potentially more or more informed uh, future research opportunities. Okay, and then the other this is from another project of ours. Uh, I, I told you about the, or we were talking about the uh, approach by developing a, uh, a framework to begin with, okay? The other approach is to, uh, uh, first of all, look at the themes of a particular domain, right? So in this example, we have, say, topics on brand origin, uh, brand positioning, um, consumer evaluation of the brand and brand management, et cetera. And what we do is we use network theory to 
uh, pretty much take the weak ties approach uh, to network theory by Granovetter and connect distant uh, topics to uh, explore new uh, research directions or what could be potentially um, a, a new research direction. And this is also something that is uh, well established in, in Kuhn as well, where Kuhn states that, that themes that are on opposite sides of a research domain typically require, or not require, but typically allow for uh, fruitful uh, future research opportunities as well. So what we can do is, for instance, we can combine, say, brand positioning and brand origin uh, as, as an opportunity and explore what types of research questions, research themes could result from, from that. We could look at, excuse me, brand origin and international marketing standardization as, as another uh, potential um, um, direction. And then also brand management and consumer evaluation of, of the brand. Um, so that's just a, a few different ways that, that we could uh, potentially pursue uh, that. Um, and then uh, kind of uh, summing up here, uh, what we're able to do with knowledge structure or, or intellectual structure is we're able to, to look at sort of what drives a particular research area. Um, and not necessarily just what's the most influential uh, at any given time, um, but what's driving the literature. So is it going to be a particular, particular uh, uh, research area or is it going to be a particular, particular tradition or, or what exactly is driving um, that, that domain? That's going to be one one area of, of benefit. And it also allows us to, back to that network uh, theory issue that I was talking about before, uh, that's an underlying premise throughout when we use bibliometrics is it looks at the interrelationships of uh, those research topics that you can see. And that it, it uh, is not just in reference to what we um, do here or what we did here today. Uh, or what we showed today. It's in pretty much any bibliometric uh, uh, application that, that you see. It's based on uh, some form of, of network application. And also, uh, if you uh, look at it and, and apply it kind of the way we, uh, we, we've been doing it for, for a little while, uh, it gives you the opportunity to, to develop and and propose theory-based uh, future research directions uh, that can be considered by, by the field. Um, and again, it can be in the form of potentially a, a, a model, uh, a research framework of some sort, like we saw, or it could be by using the weak ties network theory approach as well. So uh, with that, um, I uh, thank you for, I, I believe Said thanks you for tuning in as well. And I look timing. forward to questions. Good timing, good timing. Uh, uh, you've done very well. Uh, it's been very informative. I really appreciate it, Said and Brian. Uh, I can see that uh, the call citation analysis does allow uh, us to use the empirics uh, and combine it with our interpretations. I like the two-directional, uh, two-dimensional analysis that it provides, moving from just looking at the citations alone. And then also the opportunity to develop a framework, uh, an antecedents, process, consequences, type of evolutionary, uh, more dynamic uh, view of the literature. It allows for that as well. And I think that's really ideal for the researcher to be able to combine empirical data with the insights and creative uh, creativity of the researchers. So it, it gives us that opportunity. And your illustration of the global branding was very useful. I think then we can see how you have proceeded in your research. 
so uh, in the interest of time, we'll close this session uh, by thanking our distinguished speakers, Saeed and Brian, and remind everybody that the slides that uh, Saeed and Brian have used will be sent to you in an email, and you'll be able to see the recording of this session uh, in just a few days on our Georgia State University cyber website, as well as on our YouTube uh, channel. So with that, thank you again, uh, everybody who joined us today from around the world. We had almost 90 people uh, join us from around the world. Uh, so we appreciate everybody tuning in and uh, we look forward to seeing you at another uh, Georgia State University cyber webinar. Have a good rest of your day.